He's a genius. <laughs> the the, uh, the tech person couldn't get the overhead working, and Jay couldn't get the overhead working, which just as well, he was ready to do his. I said, no, no, that's fine. You know, and so Ali comes up and figures it out. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Received a received an ambiguous text. Is that right? One of those. Okay. Good morning. We're we're gonna finish up the uh, you know history's boring I know but we're gonna we're gonna finish up this history thing I, like I said this is this is all part of the conversion to the religion so I want to make sure when you walk out here today you are converted. But uh, so we got some slides here that of uh, things of interest. Um, outreach students, uh, those of you who want to attend our lab, if you if you want to come, I know there's some people who ask about that. You're more than welcome to come to our labs. Obviously not in the classroom. We don't have enough seats. But okay, well, this is where we left off. Necessity is the mother of invention. Everybody knows what that means, right? That that means that you are forced into coming up with alternative ways because there's no way that you can compete. And and if you look at the history and how Toyota developed, you'll notice that they're always responding to a roadblock and trying to implement a system like Ford. Can't do it, okay, what about this? Can't do it, okay, what about this? So they have a lot of obstacles in their development that force them into coming up with creative ideas to create a car company to compete with Ford. And it just so happens all those creative ideas cause them to be much more flexible with a higher quality product, which ultimately nearly put the arsenal of democracy out of business. Okay. No guest workers allowed in Japan. Ford utilized a large population of immigrant labor for the Ford facility. So Toyota didn't have that available to them. Immigrants couldn't come to that country and work in their, their uh, company. Uh, foreign investment was prohibited in Japan to protect the development of their industry. So there wasn't the money, there wasn't the infusion of cash or capital to be able to buy thousands of presses. Japan was starved for foreign capital. Purchase of te technology was not possible. Toyota's capital budget could not fund the stamping press methods used by mass producers. The mass production method required hundreds of presses, and the Toyota budget could only afford a few press lines. Now imagine, they, they don't have an entire large operation of presses stamping out the same thing over and over again, and another batch of presses stamping another model out over and over again. They just have a handful of presses. Obviously, they need to change these over rapidly if they're going to get full use out of them. And if they're going to change them over rapidly, they've got to figure out how to do that. Detroit didn't do that, so they have to come up with a method. And that's the SMED we'll talk about later. Western presses were designed to operate at 12 strokes per minute. Toyota's projected annual volume at the time was a few thousand per year. So if you're buying these presses, they're, they're absurdly underutilized and they're way too expensive to be able to accommodate the growth of their industry. If you remember that old uh, GM video, how every six seconds you could see equipment moving. If they only have a few thousand a year, they can't capitalize a facility with equipment systems like that. They have to be very flexible with limited budgets. <coughs> Dies could be changed to utilize the press, but dies weighed tons and required very precise alignment. A slight alignment issue would create defects and could damage dies. So this is even critically more important. If I'm going to change over rapidly, I better have an assurance that I'm doing this well. Detroit employed die change specialists. Changeover could take a day. Some presses were dedicated for the life of the product. So it's time to run the next model. In a day, we'll have the press ready. Toyota couldn't survive that. If you remember earlier, we are talking, their initial market that they had to grow in required multitudes of different vehicles, and they only had a handful of presses. So they had to change over rapidly in order to satisfy their market and to build volume. The only solution was to develop die changes every two or three hours versus two or three months. And eventually that became two or three minutes under 10 minutes, single minute exchange of die. And again, Toyota must satisfy their market first. They had a wide variety of vehicles that they were going to grow. Due to production workers being idle by changeover, Taichi Ono decided to deploy the idle workers to perform the die changes. So if I'm shutting the line down, I've got a batch of employees why don't I just utilize them to rapidly change the die? Not possible in mass production. Why could you not do that in mass production? Any ideas? So one guy does his one job and three does for years and years and years. Boom. Very good. Yeah. Everybody's, their labor is so specialized. They don't have this variety of knowledge that they can do anything. Not to mention, once they became unionized, they had unionized classifications. Electrician couldn't be a millwright. A millwright couldn't uh, do plumbing. An operator on the line could do no technical work. They are very heavily classified and they're very specialized. So they couldn't just utilize labor that's available to them. Toyota purchased a few used American presses and experimented with the process of rapid dye change. <coughs> a quick dye change of dyes was perfected in the late 80s, time reduced from a day to three minutes. So imagine that, a day to three minutes to change a dye. A lot of engineering and a lot of thought and a lot of creativity has to go into being able to do that. And that was, uh, if you recall, Shigeo Shingo was really the guy who really pushed that concept and helped uh, Taichi Ono implement it. 
Again, single minute exchange of dodge, you'll see more of this. There's a lecture on this. We'll talk about what that is. That's critically important. Do you think that all companies in manufacturing are practicing SMED now? No. 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 Did you say no? Yeah, no. That's okay. Here, you, you can go ahead. <laughs> no, it's amazing. It's really amazing. You go out there in manufacturing and you see they're just pounding out thousands of items of the same type. They're taking forever. They don't, their lead time is ridiculous, but they're in an industry where I like to say they can accidentally make money. They're probably competing with other competitors that are practicing the same old practices they are. And it's prevalent. It's not that it's unusual. It's, it's not typical that you have lean shots. Primarily only in automotive. <clears throat> An unexpected outcome was less expensive per part than mass production. Now they say unexpected, right? So it, you can understand why unexpected. Because they said, we need these presses, we need to change them over rapidly. That's the only way we can compete. So their, their motive was to try to change these presses over rapidly so we can build all of our models because we only have a handful of presses. But the result of it was, it was much less expensive to build the product, which they really weren't driving for that. They're just driving to try to develop an industry. And so that was as a result of work in process inventory being reduced. Because if I'm not, if I'm not stamping parts out JIT just in tons, it's my joke, by the way, that means just in time. If I'm not stamping parts just in tons, I'm stamping parts out just in time. I'm producing only what the next process needs when it needs it. Now there could be overproduction a little bit there because you have to manage some of these things, but that's the ideal. So by reducing that whip inventory, they reduce the time it takes for an order to delivery to the customer. They reduce all the waste in the system. They reduce defects significantly because there weren't warehouses full of parts that could be defective. Remember Judoka? That's the term of building quality in station, not passing a defect forward. So SMED really fed into both of these indirectly with Jodoka, directly with just in time. A skilled, motivated workforce was required to do these things. At the time of the study, Toyota used very little offline repair. Mass production used 20 to 25% of labor, labor to repair cars offline. I saw this. That's true. An awful lot of offline repairmen. Car goes through the entire process where all the value is added, rolls off the line, it's ready to ship to the customer, and 25% of your assembly workforce is fixing it. You see the waste re related to this? It's unbelievable. Why? Because they don't build quality in station because they don't have Jadoka. They had to push the metal. I, I know back in 80s, you, it's a frightening thing to hit a line stop. It's gonna draw a lot of attention. So they weren't really encouraged to stop and fix. And really there wasn't a, a large effort to design the work and the product so it can't fail. Because we have, we have a lot of people offline that can repair. <clears throat> and then Ono and Don Cord stopped the line and solved the problems as they occurred. So in, in my opinion, Ono put the end on cores on the assembly line because they weren't able to come up with a strategy to have the machine, like the uh, loom, thread breaks, loom shuts down. They did a lot of things with equipment. The equipment could sense the failure, line shut down. Where they couldn't, how about let's just give a cord to the person doing the work. If they see it, pull the cord, stop the line. So it's kind of an extension of the equipment being able to perceive the defect. Kind of a weak, in my opinion. It's good, but it's a little bit weaker because that assumes people see defects. So you have to then design the works to where the defect is obvious, so you can stop the line. Because the primary problem in manufacturing is you don't know. You don't know you have a defect, even if you're allowed to stop. So when you go down and you build Lego cars on your first run, that'll be very, very clear to you that you don't know you're producing defects. And then they use the 5Y method of, re of resolution to solve problems. They use their workforce to use the 5Y. People familiar with 5Y? It's just simply asking why five times and then checking that your responses make logical sense. And there's some level of training, but it's relatively simplistic. Uh, what, how does that compare to Six Sigma? Six Sigma is a barrier to most of your workforce that can't use it, right? 5Y is something that everyone on the line can use, right? So if Toyota wants to push a problem-solving system, doesn't it make sense if they use their entire workforce to solve problems that they use something with the simplicity that everybody can use? And I like to think that Ono was so obsessively compulsive about standards, standardization of everything, that I think he uses this 5Y, the power of it's not the method necessarily, it's more that it standardizes the thinking process of problem solving for everyone in the organization. So he standardized people's minds. They must all think methodically in the same way through problems. He has, he's reduced variation in the way people attack problems by using 5Y. And to me, that's the power of it. Line stops were excessive in the beginning. Toyota could not survive unless problems were permanently resolved. This is a Bob term. <laughs> I just throw it up there because I love the guy, even though he beat me to a pulp. Bob, Bob would say, what is your irreversible corrective action? He wanted to be emphatic that I don't want to hear that you're going to adjust the work instruction. I want to know what you're going to do to redesign process to where it can happen. And of course, we couldn't always do that. Again, that was the expectation. Proper use of the 5Y methodology was critical to success. Workforce skill and motivation are absolutely required. You must have an inspired, motivated workforce. Has anybody worked in manufacturing in here? 
Is the workforce typically pretty inspired and motivated where you've been? No. <laughs> a lot of places, no. Right? Is it because they just randomly hired the wrong people? Something else is wrong, right? The system is what's wrong. And the way you lead the organization, the way you integrate people into the process, that's what's wrong. I like to say most people just get turned off. Doesn't take long. Boom. Done. Not going to get anything out of them. They've had enough. They know you don't care anyway. Remember I've made the point about a common thing in mass production is employees withhold information. No, they don't. They just know that no one's interested in the information, so they quit talking. <clears throat> so this inspired people is critically important if Toyota's going to be successful in solving problems. Okay, the supply base. So here's the OEM assembly plant. Here's the supply base. Obviously, if that's not impacted, we're going to have minimal success with this system. So Toyota became partners with the supply base. Mass pits suppliers against each other, and they continually shop price. If you remember my Deming quote, I was at the Deming lecture because I'm that old. And Deming, Deming asked the purchasing guy, what do you do? He didn't know he was a purchasing guy unless he planted him. I don't know. It was just too perfect. The guy said, I work at, in purchasing for GM. And, and Deming said to him, oh, well, you know, maybe my grandson can get a job with you because he knows the difference between a high and a low number. That was his point. You don't think. You don't care about the process. You're not concerned with how well you develop your product. You don't care how it integrates into the manufacturing process. You care whether it's a dime instead of 15 cents. That's all you care about. And that's how mass operates. That's not how Toyota operates. Mass system created a disincentive or inability to improve cost and quality as design and manufacturing issues were not shared with the supply base. Cost advantage by one could eliminate the competitor. Ideas and innovations were secrets because they're all looking out for themselves. They're trying to put each other out of business. The suppliers, they're trying to survive. And if they didn't do that, they wouldn't survive because low cost would win. Ford and GM designed most of the 10,000 parts required to build a car. They would then ask suppliers to bid quality, defective parts per thousand, and price. So just a handful of smart people at GM came up with the design. How do you think that works? The entire supply base with all their expertise had no say in that. They just shopped, they just quoted a price. What's that do for the quality of design? Or even the cost of the product being produced. They can't be innovative in how they produce it in terms of cost and quality. So you've cut off I don't know, 80, 90% of the entire process of making a car from thinking, and you put it in the hands of only at the top. Toyota suppliers organized in tiers. First tier suppliers worked with Toyota on design. So they had a part to play in designing the product itself. Toyota asked them to work on a design that functioned with other systems. We don't care what you do. Here's what we need it to do. Work on it. We'll give you all the information you need to develop the best product you can come up with, with the highest quality and the lowest cost. You have full discretion to develop it. They also encouraged to learn from each other. First tier suppliers did not compete. Boy, that's big. So now they can talk to each other. Now they can work together. Hey, what, that design you're making on the brake system, can you talk to us about that? Because we're trying to design the lines that feed it. And we want, maybe there's a coupling between the two systems that we can agree to that's going to save us both money. We've got an idea on how to do that. And it actually is better, more robust. Can't happen in Detroit. Second tier supplier were specialists. They were grouped in associations that were also not competitive with each other and encouraged to share information. You see how this, the construction of this entire system goes beyond the assembly plant and it goes out to the supply base and it encouraged creativity of all aspects of the business, of the enterprise. People thinking, people solving problems. It goes back to Ono's comment, I think it's Ono. We don't come here to make cars, we come here to think. Toyota holds an equity stake in their tier one suppliers. They share information and help their supply base improve operations. So they're truly partners with the supplier. Many of Toyota top managers not in line for senior positions are given top leadership roles in tier one suppliers. They're putting their own people, well-trained, well-developed in supplier locations to teach, to teach them how to manage these systems and improve. Ono then incorporated Kanban material movement through the entire value stream. So if you have the assembly plant here, all the material that moves within that plant, that's important. Just in time and quality, Judoka, how about the rest? If we start working through that whole supply base and we create just in time flow of material on every link all the way to the bottom, boy, we've got something powerful that might be able to put the arsenal of democracy out of business. Didn't really intend on it, we just wanted to compete. But we've, we've come up with something that is incredible. We have come up with a third generation of manufacturing. Internal engineering management, I use this one, division of labor for engineers. The door lock engineer example, what I'm gonna talk about, we, I had a door line when I was in Sterling Heights Assembly, and there's this great guy, he's the, he's the engineer, resident engineer for door systems. But he honestly, I don't think he could have designed anything on the door. His job was to interface with the supplier and make sure they weren't screwing up. So he became almost a bureaucrat and an administrator. He was not a design engineer. The suppliers designed the product. They quoted the price. They said, here's what we're going to give you. He made sure they met their quality requirement. If something didn't work out, he would be hammering the supplier because they had issue. Yes? Um, I have a question in regards to, uh, I'm sure you've heard of the airbag problems yeah. going on in Toyota and Honda. Takata. Right. Um, 
how's that fitting? Because I know that they were a supplier and currently they're not able to supply enough uh, airbags to fix all of the defects. That Why would you ask me a question like that that I can't even begin to answer? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, well, they're having major, major problems with this. Uh -huh. I mean, you know Sean Gallagher? Sean Gallagher, I think he's had a car now for two or three months, a loner, because his car has one of those airbags. Yeah, I couldn't purchase they're, one earlier. Yeah, he, he, it's not fixed yet. So you can imagine the response to this problem as large as it is. They're not capable. They're not capable of fulfilling the demand. Nobody, nobody thought they were going to have to go back five years and build airbags in one month. You know, so they've got a major issue with this. So what went wrong there, PFEMA or DFEMA? You familiar with PFEMA, DFEMA? I'm not, sir. Uh, failure mode effects analysis. It's a DFEMA problem. The design didn't take into consideration the potential for failure. It wasn't a process issue in the assembly. It's an issue in the design. Both design and process must be thoroughly analyzed using PFEMA or DFEMA for risk. Somebody missed it. I can't remember. I think there could have been potential criminal problems with that where there were emails about it, but I, I don't quite recall. Now and then, this happens. You know, GM, the key falling out of ignition. And before you guys were old enough to even hear it, maybe not born, the Firestone tire problem nearly put Ford out of business because people were getting killed because the tire wouldn't hold up. So when people start dying and they discover it, 10 or 15 people have died and it becomes an issue, that's devastating to these companies. But it's always possible that it can happen. There's a question? Oh, I didn't answer your question, did I? Fair enough, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> Lean created multidiscipline teams which encompassed all areas including process. Strong leaders regardless of discipline were promoted. In other words, they might even let me manage an engineering team and I'm not an engineer at Toyota. Because they'd say, you know, Tom has the right characteristics to make sure things happen. Eh, we don't care whether he can engineer it or not. There's a lot of engineers on the team. Let's have him run that team. They would do that. Uh, I think that's why I love them so much. They respect me. <laughs> I have something to offer. Toyota production systems matured. After 20 years of attempting to implement their ideas throughout Toyota and the supply base, Toyota achieved their goal. They're a legitimate company. They put their system in place. They could compete. Toyota's flexibility allowed them to build multiple models per plant. That's a, that's a huge issue because this, this is really getting to the flexibility, which is a key in Toyota. I can build anything you want next cycle on a machine. Well, that's ideal. Remember, that's being like God. But they're so close to that, and mass is so far from that. That flexibility is great. If I can build multiple models in an assembly plant, you think that gives me a competitive advantage over Ford or GM that can only build one model in an assembly plant? Huge advantage. Toyota's lean product development introduced a new vehicle to market in half the time of traditional mass production firms, doubling the product offering with the same development budget. Huge. That might just put the arsenal of democracy out of business. That is huge. <clears throat> Toyota transplants were building two to three vehicles versus one assembly plant at GM and Ford. Toyota was now poised to capture market share. Yes. Yes, Sensei. <laughs> if the, the 384, I toured the Honda in Marysville, Ohio, where they were building two different versions of the Honda, the Accord and the Civic, on the same line. They were coming down 36, 8, 10 Civics, different body styles, and the same thing with the Accords. And, um, I got to the place where they, they had to switch over the, one of the welding stations and they had two big boxes, uh, frames that had welding arms on it. So one box would slide out in the, for the Accord, and the other box would slide in for the Civic. Then six or eight Civics would go through that box and get welded, and then the other box, it would slide out. So that, that was really my first time to see mixed model final assembly lines and, and the Prius going into it. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. And you think about the investment in the, that, that system. Yeah. It's a lot of money to set that system up, yeah. right? But it dwarfs the savings that you gain from flexibility. Yeah. The savings that the company gains from being flexible is a multitude of times greater than the large investment to set these systems up to be flexible. So when you hear about SMED and changeover, there's cost associated with it, but it's nothing in comparison to the flexibility you create. Do your whole system. Yeah. Six months later, I toured Ford Mustang and was told by the engineer that was giving me the tour that that's not possible. To get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> I swear I saw a flying saucer. As cars became too complex for the average owner to repair, reliability became much more important to the customer. Toyota's use of workforce to stop the line and on root cause the problems and permanently solve them led to unprecedented quality. And I saw this back in the 80s. You know, there, there were, I lived in the Detroit area, right? And there were these traders in the population and they just started buying Toyotas. Or, hey, we build, we build American cars here and they were buying Toyotas and they couldn't resist. They couldn't resist because these cars were obviously, obviously better cars. And once that became pretty well known, you're in serious trouble because you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose market share rapidly. And there's no question. I think you, you bought your first Toyota, didn't you, Jay? I bought a uh, Land Cruiser uh, to get around in the snow in Vermont, and then I traded that in for a Toyota Celica. That was in 70, 71, 72. Uh, the Celica was one of the first ones off the boat. And uh, 
Yes. You know, at, at this point about repair, back in the 60s, any of us could fix a car. Yeah. You could go in, take a starter off, put another starter. Even I could fix a car, Ali. They were easy to fix. I mean, it was simple. You know, you had backyard mechanics fixing cars. So they could buy a car. It could be a piece of junk. They could fix it. No problem. But when you started, had advancements in spark control computers, when the under dash, you pick the hood up and there, there's no room to even put a wrench, your ability to fix cars kind of started to go away. So you need one that you don't have to worry about. Toyota worked out a system of build-to-order with its dealer network. They worked closely with dealers whom they either wholly owned or had equity stake in scheduling orders to smooth production at the assembly plants. This greatly helped to accomplish the principle of making only what the downstream process requests from the smallest supplier to the final customer. So you had a leveled schedule. So when you look at an assembly plant, you see they're building 1,000 cars a day. And for the next year, every day they're building 1,000 cars. Do you think that's how demand works? It's that perfect? No. So they manage it. They manage it in a number of ways. They have agreement with their dealers to keep it at 1,000. Companies offer incentives to sell more cars to keep it at 1,000. They take line shutdowns for a month to keep it at 1,000 because it's critically important that they don't affect the speed of the line. So they have to level that schedule. Then they can construct this system of just-in-time flow and flexibility. Okay, a couple of quotes here, and they're very similar. Womack is the author of The Machine That Changed the World, but these two quotes are very similar. Taichi Ono, all we are doing is looking at the timeline from the moment the customer gives us an order to the point that we collect cash. He's very direct. And we're reducing that timeline by reducing non-value-added waste. Non-value-added waste primarily in this case is massive, massive inventories, which take forever for a car to flow through the entire process. If you're going first in, first out through the inventory piles, it's amazing how long that car actually takes to get out from the entire supply base. So he's saying, completely eliminate inventory, then the time from order to delivery is the cycle time of the system added up, theoretically. So that's what he's trying to do. No <coughs> defects, no inventory, ideally, ideally. <laughs> and then Womack, I think he wanted to be pretty smart about this too, so he said something very similar, but obviously uniquely to him. All we are really trying to do in lean manufacturing, so this is good, this is important, because he's summarizing everything here. All we are really trying to do is get one process to make only what the next process needs when it needs it. No batching, right? I don't build stuff people aren't using and pile it up. We are, link, we are trying to link all processes from final consumer back to raw material in a smooth flow without detours that generate the shortest lead time, highest quality, lowest cost. And we'll get into that. After we get through this boring history, we'll start talking about these systems. So this, I just threw a few books up here. There's about 10,000 more on the subject, but the point is this is very common discipline in the world. You might not know that in your industrial engineering program, <clears throat> but the whole automotive world reads tons of lean literature. They're all fairly well-versed, and, and these are all pretty high-selling books on the discipline of lean. So if you're going into industry, you got to know these things. And this is just a slide to give you an idea. It's not all the tools, but it's a pretty good collection. Jadoka controls quality and station. Some of the tools, just in time, controls material flow, eliminating inventory. And Kaizen is how we improve. And that's, that's not a, obviously not a complete list, but just to give you a sense about that. Okay, Detroit's explanation of Toyota's success. So the next paragraph, this is going to be boring because it's my thoughts. <laughs> okay, I'm Detroit now, I'm talking. I'm, I'm angry because we have this competitor coming to our shores and it's, it's threatening our way of life. The Japanese culture is ideal for driving efficiency and quality. Their employees care about the future of the company. They work hard without close supervision. They can be relied upon to pay close attention to their work. What are we supposed to do with these lazy American workers? We have no chance. We have no ability as leaders of the organization and designers of the system to have an impact. We're at the mercy of these dumb, lazy American workers. That was the attitude or the excuse. We are saddled with a militant union that demands more and gives less. They hold the proverbial gun to our heads, demanding pay, vacation, and benefits while their performance declines. Our performance as a company is not totally within our control. We need government tariffs on Japan to protect our market. Very common thought. Do some of you believe that? If you do, you've got to change your thinking here. At the time of GM's plant closure in 84, we talked about this last class, but a little bit more detail. The employees were considered, and this is the Fremont, California assembly plant, the employees were considered the worst workforce in the automo automotive industry in the United States, according to the United Auto Workers. This isn't the company. This is the union saying, these workers are the worst. They're not just GM. Ford Chrysler and GM. It, they're pathetic. They're terrible. The, the union was saying this. It was that bad. The United Motor Manufacturing Incorporated, NUMI, was an automobile manufacturing company in Fremont, California, jointly owned by General Motors and Toyota that opened it. The factory which NUMI took over was built by General Motors and operated by them from 62 to 82. So this was a, a large assembly plant in the General Motors uh, company. By the way, that's the uh, Tesla plant now. Same plant. Uh, the idea of reopening the plant emerged from the need that GM had to build high quality and profitable small cars and then the need of Toyota, Toyota had to start building cars in the United States as a requirement due to the possibility of import restrictions by Congress. Remember, the automotive people are saying, you've got to protect us. 
they got, they got people that care. We don't. We, we got to protect our industry. So these tariffs were a real threat. So Toyota would love to, nothing more than to come over here and start building cars. Once they get integrated in our system, it's kind of hard to throw them out because a lot of jobs are at stake. They're smart about that. New me. <laughs> Employees drank alcohol on the job, were frequently absent, enough so that production lines couldn't be started, uh, and even committed petty acts of sabotage, such as putting Coke bottles inside door panels. I, I would have said beer bottles. I think that would have been better. More. Coke bottles inside door panels so that they'd rattle and annoy the customer. In other words, they're sabotaging the quality of their own company. In spite of the history and reputation, when Numi reopened the factory for production in 84, most of the troublesome GM workforce was rehired. And I think I read where Toyota kind of wanted it that way. Give us those lousy, lazy, belligerent union members of yours, and we'll show you how to run a plant. Uh, the workforce was rehired with some sent to Japan to learn the Toyota production system. Workers who made the transition identified the emphasis on quality and teamwork by Toyota management is what motivated the change in their work ethic. By December of 84, the first car, a yellow Chevy Nova, rolled off the assembly line. Almost right away, the Numi factory was producing cars with as few defects per hundred as those produced in Japan. Almost right away. And became the best performing GM plant in the company with lousy, lazy union workers. So that's not what it was. That was the scapegoat for an inferior system that they were running. And no offense to them about the inferior system. When a new system comes along, you just don't adapt to it. But it would be a good idea to at least recognize they had a superior system and work to fix it. And they did. They did because they did the joint venture. It was not the inferior, it, it was the inferior mass production system. That's why it was the worst performing plant in the system. Do you think that we have inferior mass production systems in the state of Alabama now? They're everywhere. Great opportunity for you as industrial engineers. Although you'll have trouble, I mean, if you're not in a position of authority of implementing these things, because sometimes they're counter to the goals and objectives of the organization. Sometimes, always. <clears throat> so now, the question is, how well has mass production adapted, right? So if Numi was an example, and the world took notice, and they learned their lesson, and they could no longer make those ridiculous arguments that somehow it's genetic or cultural and we're not capable, all that stuff goes out the window with the Numi experience. So you'd think Detroit Automotive would say, okay, I guess we need to transform our industries and work towards this. So how well did they do? Harbor Report is the primary indicator of vehicle manufacturers' overall competitiveness. And it's published every year. Every model produced across the earth. And they segment these models and they measure, the, the metric is hours per vehicle. HPB. Harbor reflects the efficiency of engineering design, manufacturing, execution, and other functional support. In other words, all labor. Everybody that has something to do with building the car, not the person putting the part on a car, every aspect of it. How many hours per vehicle does it t take to produce a vehicle? It's published annually in the Harbor Report. You've got to buy it now. I have a chart here when you didn't have to buy it, but it, it's something that needs to be purchased. But all the companies wait with bated breath to see how they compare in the Harbor Report because it's key. So their CEOs are concerned about this, and they're driven off of this because it's measuring them against every other model in their segment. So here's a chart to 2011 from 2007 for GM and Chrysler. There's a $606 vehicle advantage versus Detroit, and you see that that gap is closing quite a bit, if not closed by 2016. In other words, in terms of efficiency, efficiency of labor, it's apples and apples with Japan. Now this is JD Power IQS. That's their primary metric for quality. It's a feedback from the experience of the customer with the vehicle in the first 90 days of ownership. A statistically significant number of surveys are sent out to owners of all vehicle brands and models. The data is compiled and reported annually as conditions per 100 units. So if you have a 200 score, it means you have two conditions per vehicle or 200 conditions per 100 vehicles. So it's a per 100 score. That's the standard. J.D. Power is a primary quality indicator for customer satisfaction in the automotive industry. This chart just goes to 2010, and in 99, what, what they're comparing here is import brands and U.S. brands. Actually, in 2010, U.S. brands outperform imports on the perception of quality, not by consumer report, one guy with a handful of cars who could have been paid off, who knows, but by thousands and thousands of customers owning the vehicles. So it's a very, very legitimate measure of quality. So that's pretty remarkable that this is occurring, right? How about this, 2015, 2015, Chevrolet, Toyota. Now does that mean Toyota's not a great company anymore? No, it means there's healthy competition across the globe. It means that Detroit has integrated lean into their operation for survival successfully. And the metrics for efficiency and quality are negligible between the two. It's a validation of the third generation of manufacturing.
that yes, it can convert a company. And this is the Automotive OEM Supplier Working Relations Index. It looks like in 2005, they weren't too happy with U.S. auto manufacturers compared to uh, Honda and Toyota, Nissan, and you see how these are all grouped together in 2012. Remember we talked about those slides, how they work with the tier ones and tier twos, and they give them discretion, and they don't threaten them on price is key because it's the entire enterprise of building the car. Yes? Um, we did a very uh, severe drop for Toyota and Honda from, 450, from like 415 and 380 to 296. Uh, is there any reason for that? Yeah, will you quit asking these difficult questions? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, that's a good question. Um, which, what, what color line? Let's, okay, red and, red and, blue, uh, red and blue, sir. That's interesting. I, I'd imagine maybe because the competition with Detroit's getting so difficult because it's highly competitive that they had to be a little bit more demanding on some of the other suppliers than maybe in the past. I'm just speculating. So maybe they're adopting some tactics that work for Detroit. Suppliers aren't happy about. I don't know. Now, remember, Toyota borrowed an awful lot from Henry Ford. So this isn't really a one-way street. I mean, there were good ideas, and Detroit does some things well. And that could reflect some of that. Maybe there's a coming together of the strategies with the supplier base. I don't know. That's a good question, though. Yeah, they actually publicly said they, that. They actually publicly said that. And apologized for it. So you have to, you know, if you, it's, a, it's a great example of if you don't maintain vigilance on your, on your system, your system will decay. And, uh, systems require require maintenance and management. If you don't maintain it and manage it the right way, it will decay and it will fall apart. Remember, the ball rolls backward if the right. standard's not in place. So yeah, so it's always a challenge to maintain control. What they, they got the, this is about the time where they decided they wanted to be the biggest car manufacturer in the world, and they let volume overcome. I think Bob was working there at the time. <laughs> and and the, the, the real, uh, I mean, that actually ended up causing the president of Toyota Worldwide to, to resign and change in management. And I, I think it's an excellent point. 2010, I think the North American volume for cars was 14 million, dropped to 10 million. That's when Ford and Chrysler, or, I mean, Chrysler and GM went bankrupt because they couldn't cover fixed costs. I mean, they're just bleeding at the aorta. There's nothing they could do. Just the fixed cost of existing was putting them out of business. Okay, Toyota's methods have deteriorated. Well, what do the slides on Harbor tell you? Toyota's methods have deteriorated. Detroit learned the lesson of lean and matured their systems. Detroit has learned the lessons of lean and matured their systems. That's what it tells you. This is not the quiz, I'm sorry. I, I formed that in the wrong way, sorry. So that's, that's the point. Detroit, thank God, has learned their lesson. All right. Okay, questions. <laughs> 